these uh, restaurants here, off in the distance, we have the oldest bank in Nova Scotia. This bank was founded by a privateer. Has anyone heard the term privateer before? There's a song, a very famous Halifax song called Various Privateers. It goes, of a broken man on a Halifax pier, the last of Barrett's privateers. This guy was a privateer. It's essentially a legitimate pirate. And he became so rich, stealing bounties from ships, and when he retired, he was the uh, richest man in the entire country. Now we're coming into the, uh, the little nooks and crannies of our waterfront. And as we do, we can see off in the distance, we have Theodore Tugboat getting ready to come in. Theodore Tugboat, my favorite boat in Halifax Harbor. He's the only boat that's legally allowed to wear a hat. Took a lot of paperwork to make that happen. Hello! Now, Theodore Tugboat uh, just turned 10 here not too long ago. Actually, on uh, June 12th, he turned 10. We had a big celebration for him. Hello! And, uh, of course, we do honor him here in the harbor. He goes out and takes kids on tours, teaches them all about the Halifax Harbor, and, uh, and meets all of his friends out in the water. Also, we have uh, Murphy's Restaurant here. Murphy's Restaurant, great place to check out a lobster dinner if you're craving some lobster after the tour today. And it's built out on top of the Cable Wharf. Now, the Cable Wharf got its name because it's where they would house all the giant spools of cable that would haul ships in and out of the harbor. And as you can see, it's an extremely well-reinforced uh, wharf. Summer's Bay, if we have any people uh, on board who like to fish or are interested in deep sea fishing, Summer Bay's tour, I've heard nothing but amazing things about it. You go out for four whole hours, you can bring a cooler full of drinks and food, and uh, whatever you catch, they'll clean for you and give back, and you can eat it for supper that night. We also have the Acadia coming up in the water. Uh, the CSS Acadia, Canadian science ship, originally charted the bottoms of the ocean floor. And it was this boat's job uh, to make maps as it did that. Today it's retired. Survival War One, Two, and the Halifax Explosion. And it is the largest artifact in the Maritime Museum of the Atlantic. <laughs> also got a cormorant drying its wings there. Also known as the ugliest bird in Nova Scotia, but I think they're kind of cute. Now over my shoulder, if you look really closely, you can see a Corvette parked in the water here. Yeah, that's the K181. Now you've probably all heard of the Corvette in the car. Maybe thought I was being a little bit misleading there. The Navy Corvette. Hello, the K181, the Sackville, is the last remaining of the 123 Corvettes made for World War II. Only one left running in the entire world, and uh, this boat was visited just a few weeks ago by the Queen herself during Fleet Week when we were celebrating 100 years of naval independence from Britain. Real relic here in the waters. All right, as we turn around, you'll see off in the distance, we have two islands in the Halifax Harbor. We have uh, McNabb's Island, which is the further, and we also have George's Island, which is smaller, but a little bit closer to us. George's Island is known as the first line of defense for Halifax. And that's because we have that flag mast that would signal all the way up to Citadel Hill, any important information. But also, we have a secret fort built underneath the soil called Fort Charlotte. And Fort Charlotte here um, is still there today. Unfortunately, we're not allowed on the island anymore. The public is, uh, is not permitted on the island for two reasons. Um, we're not allowed on the island because the fort's a little bit run down. They need to restore it before they can start doing tours there, which I hope to soon. But also because the island itself is absolutely infested with a one-of-a-kind species of snake. It's said to be the only of its species in the entire world, protected by ecologists. You may be thinking though, Josh, you know what? It's run down, it's covered in snakes. I don't need to go to the island. Fair enough. However, they say that Enos Collins, our pirate banker over here, buried some of his treasure underneath the island. So if you bring in a, a shovel and maybe a sack for some treasure and of course some snake repellent, you may end up having a better time than you expect on the island. You never know. Don't rule it out. That's all I'm saying. All right, we'll travel back along the water here. Give us another view of the waterfront. For those of you that uh, haven't heard, um, we are celebrating uh, our uh, birthday here in August, uh, at the end of August, sorry, for Dartmouth and Halifax here natal day celebrations it's going to run all week and lots of exciting stuff happening at the boardwalk so you certainly picked a good time to visit halifax um, as we do travel back along the water though uh, it's usually about this time that i tell one of the sadder stories of our tour however it's one of the most important in halifax's history and you can even say the history of canada and that is the story of the halifax explosion 
Has anyone heard of the Halifax explosion? Several of you have heard of it before? I'll fill you in on all the details. Uh, this is a story I like to say that involves two ships, a lot of bad luck, and it ended in the absolute largest man-made explosion before the dropping of the atomic bomb. And it all happened right here in these waters. Now, way back during the First World War, the night of December 5th, 1917, we had our first of these two ships enter into the harbor. Rather, it was blocked at the front of the harbor. It wanted to come in. This was the Mont Blanc, uh, a munition ship from France. But the uh, harbor master said, I'm sorry, you'll have to wait outside till morning. They had already raised the giant chain-link fences that floated under the water to keep out submarines, and they couldn't drop them again for the next day. So the captain of the uh, Mont Blanc wasn't too happy about this, but he said, you know what? I don't want to be a sitting duck. So being a munition ship, being loaded with explosives, he decided to take down the giant red flag and said he was explosive, fold it up, and hide it in his back pocket. Now the night went by a little tense, but without incident. And the next morning, December 6th, it's an extremely foggy morning here in Halifax. One of those days that you can't see your hand in front of your face. We get about 100 days of fog a year here in Halifax. And so the, uh, the captain was able to make his slow entrance in. Now he was so relieved that nothing went wrong, he forgot to do something very, very important. He forgot to put that flag back up. And no one knew what was on board that ship. No one here in Halifax had any idea that this guy was hauling two and a half thousand tons of explosives. Everything from wet gunpowder, dry gunpowder, TNT, and even barrels of gasoline were on board this ship. Now, as it entered into the harbor, we had our second ship getting ready to leave. And that was the, uh, the Emo. And the Emo was a, uh, a British-run ship. It was Belgium originally. And it was leaving the harbor. However, it was three whole days behind schedule and totally out of patience. Unfortunately for this poor captain, he got stuck behind a tugboat. Tugboats are very powerful, but as you may know, they're not very fast. So the captain says, you know what? Enough of this. I gotta get going. I'm already late. And he pulls out around the tugboat, despite the fog, to pass it here in the Narrows, just down by our bridges. As he does, he's coming down, full steam ahead, the Mont Blanc. The two of them are set for a collision course. The captains start yelling at one another, blowing their whistles, telling each other to turn starboard, to turn port, uh, both speaking two different languages, mind you, and no decision is made. It's the very last second, the captain of the Emo decides to kick it into reverse to get out of the way, and he ends up T-boning the Mont Blanc. This wasn't actually a, a terrible collision at first. It was more of a fender bender. So the captain of the, uh, of the Emo says, you know what, I feel terrible, but no one's hurt, no harm, no foul. They'll get some paint on their hull. Everything's fine. I got to get going. Starts to back up. And as he does, we have metal on metal. What do we get? We get sparks, exactly. And the sparks start to fly. And some of them land into the barrels of gasoline on board the Mont Blanc, and the whole thing erupts immediately into flames. Now, the crew of the Mont Blanc, they know what's on board, and they realize all is lost. So they jump ship, and they start swimming over to Dartmouth, freezing cold water, December 6th. They make it alive. Um, however, their message of evacuate the city as fast as you can is not listened to because they look like they're crazy, first of all. They're soaking wet but also because they're yelling in French, and everyone at the time was English. Now, same time in the morning, about 8.30, everyone's on their way to work, on their way to school, and they all start to stop and watch the ship that is now aimlessly drifting throughout the harbor. Of course, they should have been running for the hills, but without that red flag, no one knew what was on board or what was in store for them. Of course, the uh, ship drifted, and it burned for quite a while before the magazine caught fire. It drifted for about a half an hour. Until finally, at exactly 9.04 and 35 seconds, boom, the ship explodes. All right, everyone, as we come into the water, just remind you to hang on tight, watch your glasses, your hats. Woo. Now, this explosion uh, was absolutely massive. Tremendous explosion. Instantly destroyed two square kilometers in every direction of the Narrows here. It leveled 1,600 homes, killed 2,000 people, and left 9,000 others injured and dying. Momentarily, the water was blown out of the Narrows here, and it flooded up over the city of Halifax in a huge tidal wave, of course, dragging in more victims, uh, debris, and even survivors into the freezing cold waters. Uh, they say the shock wave of the blast, as I mentioned earlier, was so severe that it blew out every window in the entire city, but it didn't stop just at the, the uh, parameters of Halifax. It went as far as Truro, Nova Scotia about one hour away from here. They say even over Prince Edward Island that morning, 
about uh, 9.05 in the morning, people said that for some reason, their dishes were rattling in the cupboards. Needless to say, all of Halifax was alerted very quickly, um, as was the rest of the province, uh, to the disaster that had taken place here. But it didn't end there. That night, uh, Mother Nature had another trick up her sleeve, and we got a huge blizzard. One of the biggest snowfalls of the entire year, blanketing the entire tragedy in a couple feet of snow. Many people left homeless, as I said, 1,600 homes destroyed, so many more homeless, um, as well as many people injured. A lot of people died of exposure during that storm. So, Halifax was, uh, was reeling for the disaster. Of course, we had a very, very difficult time putting ourselves back together, getting back on our feet. But we did have some help from our friends down in Boston. Now, Boston sent everything they possibly could to help Halifax out. They sent doctors, nurses, medical supplies. They even sent Harvard students who hadn't yet graduated from medical school to come and give us uh, a hand with the relief effort. So to end a sad story on a bit of a positive note, we do have a way to say thank you every single year to Boston. Does anyone know what that is? Yeah, it's a Christmas tree. What we do is we go down to Lunenburg County, the Christmas tree capital of the world. We cut down a Christmas tree, we ship it to Boston, and that is the tree they use for their world-famous Boston tree lighting ceremony. They do it every year right in the middle of the city. And it's our way of saying thank you for helping us to one of the worst disasters in the 